We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Ancara Mess
to number one in the Premier League. So um, yeah, and and uh, some people think, oh, it's only a throw in, but but if you can keep the ball after throw in under pressure, you you can either just keep you know keep possession or keep control, but you can also um, create a chance to score a goal. And, and in, in Liverpool, we scored 13 goals after throw in situations this season. And on the other hand, you can also say that. If you're losing the ball after throwing, then you'll uh, often get caught out of balance because you have an, an attacking mindset. You're on your way forward. so And it's really, really dangerous to lose a, a throwing under pressure, especially in your own half. So, um, yeah, I just just use all my knowledge, uh, showed on the video, showed on the pitch. And, uh, yeah, that's the way I try to let the players buy in. I mentioned marginal gains and, like, a 20% increase plus... You said thirteen goals, like that's yeah, that's not marginal gains. <laughs> like that's pretty, no. that's pretty big. When did you realize in your career that throw-ins were pretty inefficient and and wasted mostly in the in the soccer community? Was it from a lens away from the game, or was it once you come into the game, or how was that process? Oh, it, it was once I came into the game as a throwing coach. Um, I started as a throwing coach in two thousand and four with a professional club in Denmark called Vibor. And uh, yeah, the first like four seasons or so until 2008, I was only concentrating uh, about the long throw-ins. But then suddenly I was just analyzing the long throw-ins uh, uh, in a game. And, and yeah, you know, there, there are not of, there, there's not a lot of uh, long throwing opportunities, so it can also get a little bit boring if you're seeing it a whole game. But then suddenly I saw a, a, just a, a pretty normal throw-in in the middle of the pitch, and then the team lost the throw-in, lost possession, and I thought, hey, that was bad. And then uh, then they lost the next one, and the next one, and I was totally devastated because I only thought it was like amateur clubs and youth clubs who were so bad at the throw-ins all over the pitch and then I started analyzing and um, yeah then I found out that most teams have possession in under 50 percent of the circumstances when when they have a throw-in under pressure and, and, and if you have possession in under 50 percent with your feet uh, inside the pitch you, you'll not be playing professional football you're not an elite player not even in youth football you'll be playing Sunday League, fo league football then so yeah, I started in 2008 with with gaining all this knowledge about oh how how can we how can we keep the ball uh, how can we do it in different zones can we use different tools so it was it was fantastic I gained a lot of knowledge but I was just really frustrated because on uh, up till uh, July 2018 where Jurgen Klopp called me I was only coaching the long throw-ins because the clubs only wanted to have the long throw-in coaching because it's easy to measure and you can score goals and everything it it has also been a success but but for me it was much more important with the throw-ins all over the pitch because yeah you know you have 40 to 60 um yeah throw-ins in a match so so it's not only marginal games it's 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 so many situations and and in and if you're seeing normally from liverpool i'm getting the attacking and defending throw-ins on the video and that's the situation just before the throw-in and then then the following situation. And normally these uh, video files are between seven and a half and 10 minutes each. So so normally between like 15 and 20 minutes. So if you're looking at 15 to 20 minutes of, of the playing time, then then it's not no longer marginal gains. It's really, really, yeah. So, so I had all this knowledge, but I was really frustrated because no club really wants to listen to me and it was not until Jürgen Klopp called me that that uh, early July day in 2018 and said hey we 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 had a fantastic season with with the uh, fourth place in the Premier League and the Champions League final but but we were really bad at the throw-ins and yeah as I said before I I, I had some numbers it, it was made uh, in 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 uh, September 19 from uh, like a unattached analysis a firm or guy, so it's not my numbers. It's not Liverpool, not Liverpool's numbers. So, so I really had the chance to to use my knowledge in 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 Liverpool, and of course, since since uh, the breakthrough for myself with Liverpool FC and the throw-ins, then yeah, last season I had um, six different uh, pro clubs. This season I've I've, I've uh, been helping eight different pro clubs. So it's just exploded, and and more and more. Uh, coaches and managers and uh, of course also players and clubs can can see that 
the throw-ins have really big influence on on the wrestle in the football game. So um, yeah, a lot of things to do. When you add creativity and innovation to an environment, I, I'm fascinated by this because a lot of soccer environments are rigid and and the structures are are kind of set. Yeah, we we understand throw-ins are important, but we definitely won't be adjusting any session plans to do it. So how important is it that the culture of the organization and the leadership, you mentioned Klopp picking up the phone, how important is it that the coach, I suppose, has the vision or the courage to be different in this process? Oh, it's just so important because you don't you don't get innovation and and, uh, and positive improvement if you're not open, open to new things. So uh, I think it's really important, especially the leaders like the managers or the head coaches or what do you call them? It's really important that they're, that they're open minded because if you don't want to bring new things in, you, you won't you won't change it at all. So you can say that say that about not only Jurgen Klopp, but also the club uh, Liverpool have seen in general that people are very open-minded. People are, instead of thinking that, hey, I know it all, they are they are really listening. So so, so we are helping each other. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of apartment you're in, in in Liverpool FC. We're helping each other. We're asking questions. Can you help me? Hey, how did you do that? Or, or I have a thing for you. Can you use that? And it's also the same with me, even though I'm probably the, the one who knows uh, mo- uh, most about throw-ins in the whole world. It's not like I'm coming and saying, hey, I'm the throwing guru. Listen to me. Uh, of course, I have a lot of knowledge the clubs can use, and I'm also using that. But I'm, I'm very often getting advice from, of course, both both the, the staff, but also the players. Hey, this drill, what about, could we do do this drill in another way or in another angle? Or could, could we add on this these small goals to the exercise or so and then i'm saying yeah perhaps oh that was a good idea so i think you have to be open-minded of course there are some people who have to like like make the choices what should we do there and there but but you just have to be open-minded to uh, involve into to to a thing that's that's more positive so that's also that's also Mm -hmm. the the thing uh, I can feel that the clubs I'm coming in. Uh, you, you, I can feel that the the managers and 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 the head coaches and so assistant coaches they're curious. What is this? How can we put it into our training? And it's and then I, I re, I'm really doing a lot of uh, adapting to the to the club's playing style, but also to the to the club's training program. So it, it's not like I'm I'm saying, hey, uh, now it's a one and a half hour throwing coaching. Some days I'm doing 45 minutes, some days I'm doing 20 minutes. Of course, it's also always very uh, specific according to what I've been seeing in video analysis and so. Um, so, so my throwing coaching is uh, one way in Liverpool, it's one way in uh, Ajax Amsterdam, it's one way in, in Gent in Belgium. It's one way in FC Midtjylland in Denmark, so it's about adapting also to the playing style, but also to the to the culture, the circumstances. Klopp said when he met you, he was one hundred percent clear that he wanted to employ you. I'm mean, very intrigued. Uh, how did you demonstrate the importance of throw-ins in that first meeting with him? I, I think it's just like like we like we are sitting and talking uh, now here on, in on this podcast. It's just like pouring out my knowledge, pouring out the things I know, trying to tell how how I can help people. Like I, I told uh, Jurgen Klopp how I could help him. So um, and it's 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 pretty crazy when you are hearing the numbers about uh, forty to sixty throw-ins possession. Most clubs under fifty percent. And also the knowledge that that Jürgen, Jürgen had the feeling that that Liverpool were really bad in the 17-18 season. All this together, if you are forward-thinking manager, head coach, if you are innovative, if you're listening to people, then for me it's stupid not to do anything about it. Of course, you can also say you can always say that oh we we can't do do everything there, and and that's totally right. You have to decide. But but again, I think it's 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 a big thing in football if you're looking to, to the amount of throwing so i think it was just the way it was with the, with my first meeting with the uh, with jürgen klopp in, in melwood that was in the mid of july 2018 and it should only have been been like a meeting and nothing else and then i'll go back to denmark and then then we'll 
yeah talk again but he was so convinced that uh, i had the opportunity to coach 21 premier league players all already the day after the meeting it, it was all the the players who wasn't who weren't injured or at vacation after the world cup so so it was just like from from the call a week earlier to like approximately a week later i was going from yeah uh, <laughs> from a throwing coach coaching primarily danish pro clubs to coaching um, one of the biggest clubs in the world so it was a fantastic uh, fantastic adventure just take a quick break here if you're a director or coach looking for options to keep your players engaged and developing, you might want to stick around. As many of our listeners know, we've done a lot of work alongside Soccer IQ platform Sports Lab 360. In the absence of training for many, they've opened their platform to be available for short term options for clubs that are looking to keep their players progressing in their development. If you're not familiar with their work on their platform, head on over to sportslab360.com and work through a demo of one of their interactive modules. If you want to keep your players sharp and your members happy, I would personally suggest that you get in touch with Nick and his team at Sportslab360. I've known them a long time. They've helped promote the podcast. I've seen their work. They'll personally work with you and come up with something that works best for your club or team. Please check them out. www.sportslab360.com Very helpful resource during this time and Nick is known to be very generous with his discount. So make sure you tell him I sent you. Back to Thomas. Enjoy. You mentioned long throws at the start and you, and you said that that was your, your kind of initial ascent into the game was through long throws and that is, that's decreased slightly. Is, is that because teams now view long throws as not as advantageous as maybe what they were? Is it because we've, you need a certain person? Or I suppose why are we seeing less long throws now in the game? It's a lot about it, it, you can get a lot of success with with long throw-ins. We had like not this season, but but the four last season uh, seasons. FC Midtjylland, uh, one of my clubs in Denmark, was uh, they scored thirty-five goals on the long throw-ins, like on four seasons. So like nine, ten long throwing goals per season. And but but they had like really quality. Long throwers, of course, I developed them, but they also had like really tall guys, it was really physical guys too. Uh, not all, but many of them. So, and if you have if you have uh, that kind of team, it can be really effective. And I can also like help physical teams score a lot of goals on long throw-ins. It doesn't matter what country it is; it's easy. It's easy for me to help help teams score like eight or ten goals after long throw-ins because I ca I can make. I can make the players throw really, really far, uh, but I, I also know the tactics behind scoring goals and long throw-ins. But you also have to remember that I can also easily make make Liverpool FC score ten goals and long throw-ins uh, in the Premier League. That's no problem because we have there is Joe Gomez who can throw really far. But you also have to to be aware of that if you want to score, for example, like eight, ten goals and long throw-ins in a season, you have to take perhaps. 8-10 long throw-ins in each game because it's not like you can score on, on everyone. And and would you like to, would you like to see Liverpool FC take a 10 uh, long throw-ins at every game at Anfield? No, I don't think so because it's not Liverpool's playing style. So uh, oh. so I'll say yes, of course I can I can still throw uh, coach clubs who want to score a lot of goals on the long throw-ins and there are some some uh, clubs who will like have this uh, physical style so that's okay but 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 even though i'm not you know even though we're not doing really any long throw-ins towards the opponent's goal in in liverpool I, i'm still coaching uh the long throw-in with with the players with the fullbacks and why that and it's because as a fullback, the longer throwing you have, the greater throwing area you have too. And the greater throwing area you have, the more options you have uh, on a throwing. And it, it, it's also uh, at your own penalty area in the middle of the pitch. So even though we are not doing it very often in Liverpool, I've, I've been coaching the players uh, to do a longer throwing. And for example, Andy, Andy Robertson, Robo, he started up with like 19, 20 meters, and that's very short. And it's really a challenge for fullback because if you can only throw like 19, 20 meters, 
then it's really easy for the opponents to put pressure on you because you can't really throw too many of your teammates. Then he improved to, with my technical training, to 27 meters, and that he improved his throwing error with, with over 500 square meters. So, um, so, so in every club, no matter what playing style, is I'm always coaching the fullbacks in a longer throw-in because it's really helpful all over the pitch. So, um, oh. yeah, you might not see a lot of clubs doing the long throw-in towards the opponent's goal right now, but it can be really efficient if you're a physical team. And again, it's really good to uh, to do, even though you're playing like more technical, like Liverpool or Ajax or so, because of the throw-in area. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. You mentioned the culture there of you know, the playing culture of Liverpool. When you look at those clubs, you look at Midland, you look at Ajax, you look at Liverpool, the culture off the field seems to be, like, again, back to innovation, back to strong football leadership culture. I mean, what are some things in those environments, I suppose, that, that make you go, wow, whenever you walk in? First of all, let's, let's just take Liverpool. One thing is that, people are very friendly they're they're very kind to each other and of course it's, it's really important that the leader or the manager uh the head coach is also friendly because if the head coach or manager is not friendly then it like really like uh ha has an effect on, on the whole club or the culture itself and yeah Jurgen Klopp is a really friendly guy he's really kind he's really f real funny too so you know it just uh, affects everybody and uh, yeah, I, I'm 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 doing a lot of uh, talks on on uh, joy at work, working culture, cultural environment, and so uh, for companies here in Denmark. And 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 uh, research have been showing that that the best teams, it's actually uh, the teams where the people have the best relations. It's not so much about uh, how how is your how how is your strong strong tools at work it's not about how ambitious you are it's it, the most important thing in in a research from from denmark showed that it was the strongest relations that was the most important and it because if you have tr if you're trusting each other it's it's much easier to like to say hey oh can you help me with that i'm really stuck here can you give me a hand or i need some some knowledge it's also easy to say okay i've been reading this article about the hip flexor or so, can you use that in your uh, stretching exercise? Let's say it's just a physical coach who said that or so. It's much easier if you're, have, if you're trusting each other because if you have that trust, you're not competing with each other. It's, it's more like, like uh, we're there for each other, not for ourselves. And, and that's one of the things I really feel in Liverpool. People are working not like I, but they're working like we. So um, that's one of the most important thing uh, things we can do. And then uh, on top of that, as I mentioned a little bit before too, that one of the most important things is that we can help each other. The more we help each other, the more knowledge we share. We, we can never share 100% of our, our knowledge, personal or, or work knowledge, but but if we can share fifty-three percent of our knowledge instead of forty-seven, let's just just take some numbers. Then it's much better. But it's just important that first of all you're open-minded, you're friendly, but also that you're not only working in in your own area of, of the club. So if if the assistant coaches only talked with each other, with if the if the nutrition guys only talk with each other, if the analysis guys only talk with each other, then you won't get really transfer of, of knowledge and and uh, so and I really feel in Liverpool that people are really talking with each other all the time to help each other to share knowledge. So I think that's that's the main goal, and and of course it's uh, it's everybody's responsibility, but but of course it, it it comes a lot of that comes from the manager. Or, or the head coach. So, so that's the environment I'm, I'm working in at Liverpool and uh, and I love it. As much as I'm sure the coaching community have, like I said, you've embraced your work and, and from afar everyone is, is loving what you're doing, there has been scepticism and criticism from, I suppose, this segment of the media that I don't know whether it's looking to get a headline or what. Why, why do you think there is still a reluctancy? Even the success, those numbers, we can act, we can literally see it in front of our eyes, what Liverpool are doing in, in your area. 
Like, why are we so reluctant to embrace this element of creativity in the game? First of all, I really like to say that I think uh, criticism is really, really good. If we don't have any criticism, we won't really improve. We are not getting better. We're not getting smarter. We just it's just really important to slice up the criticism and and see where is the criticism coming from. If the criticism is, is is constructive and it's it's coming from people who are listening, who know something from my area, or are just curious because it's also okay to be curious. If I'm meeting a guy on the street and he's asking me something, uh, it's a little uh, perhaps it's a little bit of a criticism of of me. But if it's said in a constructive way, it's really good. I really love it because it makes me think. It it it, it makes people invo- evolve, and and that's just fantastic. But if the criticism is coming from either people who really don't know anything about what you're talking about, who's not curious, who don't want to know more, or if it's coming from from people who has, I, I won't say bad at, attention, but but I'll really say intentions, but but I'll really say, for example, if it's coming from rival fans, like say that it's it's not it's not every Man United fan or 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 CD fans who said something negative about me. Of course, it's it's only a few people. But if it's coming from a rival fan, I'm just taking it really cool. Yeah, yeah no worries. I would I, I wouldn't be that like that myself as a fan, but no worries at all because I know the mechanisms. And then sometimes it's also coming from from pundits like like uh, Andy Gray or like Steve Nichol. And I'll just say that. I almost no, not almost. I felt sorry for for both of them because it's not like it's not like you can't make fun of me and my throwing coaching and throwing coaching in general because I, I'm making fun of it myself sometimes with irony, self irony, and so so no worries there. Uh, but they weren't curious at all. None of them were curious. They just took it as a way to to try to make some entertainment. But but. Um, but for me, it backlash totally because you know, I didn't really like like really react on it. But a lot of a lot of people reacted on on the social media, like like calling them dinosaurs and 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 I, I think it's really good to that people are criticizing. Um, they don't have to agree with me. I just want to have some arguments and not like oh, it's it, it, you know like like. I really felt with both, like with Andy Gray, but also with Steve Nigel, like they could have, they could have said the same uh, after drinking uh, ten pints in a pub. You know, it it was, you know, there was no arguments. It was only like, so for me, it's it's you know, of course, I haven't really counted it, but but perhaps ninety nine percent of the the criticism that came to me was either from rival fans or it was from people who wasn't really curious really wasn't didn't want to know more just to make fun of it and and then for me it's no problem because perhaps it was if it was 40 years ago or so where of course where 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 people perhaps only read like a newspaper or or only saw the games in tv or they, they it could be even more fun but you know now people are listening to podcasts like this people are reading articles it's 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 normal fans it's not like you don't have to be a professor or have made a phd or so in something the, because the the fans now they're really they know things they know a lot about football and often they know more than the pundits so uh, yeah so they they answered for me so for me it's no problem i have, I have a lot of People who are supporting me, I, I getting, I'm getting messages every day from, from of course from fans, but also from um, from coaches, from analysis people, from um, and they're really happy because they can also see that one thing is that I'm helping helping the clubs uh, perform better, but uh, it it also makes the it also makes the game itself more entertaining because who want to who want to see the ball lost. Uh, Perhaps sixty percent of the time, when you have a throw in under pressure, it's the same. You don't want to see. A, of course, it's a it's a part of football that you lose the ball, but you don't want to lose it almost every time. So it's a really bad entertainment. So that that's what I want to bring. That's my biggest goal: is to to make football better.
So, and right now I can only do it with helping the clubs, clubs I'm, I'm coaching, but of course in the future I'll publish a book about, about throwing so I can help all coaches in the whole world. If it's in, in one year or, or, or eight years, I'll publish it. I don't know. It's almost finished, but, but you know, I, I, my biggest goal is just to, to make football better. And, and I think throw-ins are a big part of it. We'll just take our final break here with a professional development opportunity for some coaches. We all have a little bit more time on our hands at the minute, myself included. So if any coaches are looking to do a little professional development in terms of an audit of current processes, maybe get some feedback on session design, pre or post game structure, leadership models, player development, I've set up a few slots where I can work alongside individual coaches who want to be a little bit more intentional with their time during this break and do some remote work. It's 100% confidential. We want to target specific areas that you want to get better at or you want to look at. You can contact me at gary at modernsoccercoach.com for some more information. Thanks. Back to Thomas. I think that's what the, the coaching community have improved their ability to be curious and like I said, there's I don't know any coaches who would be who would dismiss it at this stage. I, no, I don't know any at all. Uh, but I know a lot of coaches that will be young coaches that will be listening to this and and be like, well, uh, that, they'll be inspired by your journey and say, well, I want to. You know, that's a pathway I would love to take. Such a unique role in the game, I'd love to make a difference. I mean, what advice would you have for a young coach who wants to be a specialist and wants to have a, a more unique role in the game? I just say I think the thing that have made given me success as, as a throwing coach is first of all I've been uh, passionate about about throwing since I was a kid since I saw my my two cousins Ben and Johnny making long throw-ins they were like ten or twelve years older than me and then of course I've been in the years up to two thousand and four I've all, all also been passionate about about, about throw ins in general. But especially when I started in two thousand and four, yeah, I've just been like thinking about throw ins like every hour of the day. And it's so my, my best advice is is of course you have to if you're if if you're it doesn't matter if you're a normal coach or a normal assistant coach or a specialist coach, coach like me, but I think you have to go really, really deep into your knowledge. So, of course, try to try to follow the general things. That's really important, especially if you are a normal coach or assistant coach. But then you just have to, if you have a special interest, if you're getting curious and think, hey, that was interesting. And, and it can be many different things. It can be like a specific technical movement. It can be something about the psychology. It can be something about nutrition for your team. You know, if you have a special interest, so just go deep into it. Try to read everything you can, see a lot of videos, but also try to get inspiration from, from other places because, you know, of course, we still have to get inspiration from our fellow colleagues, And but but try to get, get uh, inspiration from, from other fields. For example, in sports, I'm getting inspiration from, like, basketball. I've been playing a lot of basketball myself. Um I'm getting inspiration from American football, but I'm also getting inspiration like from, perhaps it sounds a little bit bit weird, but I'm getting inspiration from like uh, art and sculptures and architecture and so. And it's like suddenly I see, for example, for example, a form of art and so, and then I then I then I see it in the pitch or like like oh, if if the if the player did like this, <laughs> and so you know, it's a little bit like just go hundred percent into it, go go deep into the to the you know the field you're really interested in and then suddenly you have you like have you have um you have like a like a special skill or like a superpower and 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 even though if even though you're only etc uh, a normal coach or uh, a normal assistant coach then then your road into a good job can be that you're for example really interested in psychology okay he's really good at this assistant coach normal assistant coach things like setting a session up or talking like you know before a game to a player and so but but oh perhaps this coach has a special interest in for example psychology and and oh oh it, it could be exciting to have this guy in because we we really need that this and then suddenly it's your way into a 
a good job or an exciting position. And so, so, so of course, my advice to say it again, just stay in, uh, stay in touch with, with the general things. And if you have specific interest, then just go 100% into it. Just like go totally, go totally bananas. Just like uh, and talk with people about it. Don't don't be afraid to share your knowledge and uh, and don't be afraid to to uh, to catch people out, out, outside the football world because I think they can also uh, make us think outside the, the box and that's important. Last one for you. Your new book, Lazy Energy. I love the title. Can you talk to us about uh, what it's about? Yeah, I'll say it's not published in uh, internationally published yet, but I've been uh, publishing a book in Denmark called Lazy Energy. It's like in Danish it's called Dawn Energy, but it's Lazy Energy in English. Uh, it's been a bestseller in uh, Denmark, so I'm, I'm really proud of, of that. Um, lazy Energy has has uh, seven lazy principles inside, and it's like a it's like a book written with also with humor, uh, but it's also the content is also like research and tools and so and it's about how can we how can we reach our dreams and our goals without you know getting getting the getting totally uh, laid down with stress we have a big challenge not only in denmark but also in the western world with stress in denmark we have approximately 250 to 300,000 people down with with severe uh, stress and that's a challenge because we only uh, we are under six million people in Denmark, and it, it's it's the best uh, same thing in the Western world. So, so seven lazy principles is, is all about how can we reach our goals and our dreams and get all the good things in life, uh, and still live a life that's worth living. So, um, so the seven lazy principles is, yeah, like like the fifth lazy principles, um. It's called let the others do the work, and uh, it, it's not like uh, we have to let others do what we had to do ourselves. But it's about how can uh, we get help when we have a challenge, and a little bit the culture nowadays is a little bit like okay, you have to you have to uh, really be strong as an individual. You have to do everything. You have to work hard. You have to max out. But sometimes it's easier to um, to get the challenge done if you can get help from from other people so it's a lot about it's a lot about how can we you know uh, do more uh, sorry so we get more and, and 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 do less so it's more about doing work life efficient also like for example the first lazy principles principle is uh, relax when you can and and it's, it's not like like you have to relax all the time of course you you shouldn't do that especially not as a football coach you know you have to work a lot of hours but a lot of people are like get burned out or so because they're working too much so one of the things we know it's really important also from research is that we know that that the more passionate you are about your work then there's a greater risk of of uh, seeing the, the the signals that you are really getting stressed or getting burned out so in, in the first place, the principle, uh, relax when you can. It, it's all about how can you create small pockets of relaxation in your workday for yourself or when you come home to your family, if you have a family or in your spare time, how can you create small pockets of space that gives you, gives you like the energy to work hard? Because if you're working hard 100% of the time, yeah, you can easily, we can easily do that. Everybody like, like six months or two years, but, but, but then suddenly the tank is empty. So, so the seven lazy principles in in lazy energy is all about reaching your dreams, but uh, but also be able to enjoy life, but also uh, not to to get too stressed. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. What a great great message to finish, Thomas. Firstly, I hope that book comes out in English because I'd love to read it. And secondly, thank you so much. Um, congrats on your success, and we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, today to, to speak to all the coaches. Much, much appreciated. You're welcome, Gary. Thanks so much to Thomas for his time and his insight there. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah, I'm fascinated first off by yeah the, the marginal gains that you can get through an aspect like throw-in and the numbers that he come up with in terms of 
the goals and the possession stats. And I think I watched Leeds a few weeks ago when I was over in England and every time they had a throw in in their own half, you could see there was a set movement pattern and they broke the pressure right away, switched the play, boom, gone. And maybe not created a chance, but certainly moved the opposition or kept possession or, or advanced the game. And I thought there must be an influence of someone there doing that there. And, and whenever you get into the, the detail of it and you get players on board, I get even more fascinated by it because like it takes, we've got so much access as coaches now for information. So it's easy to say, I'm open to new ideas. I'm open to new ideas. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I'd be open to that. It's different whenever you change your environment to accommodate that there. So first off, for a club like Liverpool to look for whatever they're so successful, to look for that extra edge and you have a person like Jurgen Klopp who has probably 200 things to do in a day and he thinks, right, well, what we need to do and improve on is not necessarily go out and buy X player or get this player. It's to, to improve this part of our game. How can we improve that part of our game? There's a specialist. Well, I'll get them to work from day one. That story he said about Klopp putting them to work right away, <laughs> I thought was amazing. And then second of all, from Thomas's point of view of how he's flexible and he works with different teams in different ways. And some days it's on the training pitch. And some days it's presentations. Some days the session is 10 minutes. Some days it's 30 minutes. The ability for him as a practitioner to be flexible and adaptable and agile to work around these environments. I think that's how, in my eyes, that's how it works. It's, it's the open-mindedness on one end to, to bring them in and to commit to the process. And then it's the the flexibility and the ability of that person to deliver at in an environment that is so fluctuates so much, not just in terms of weekly schedules, but also in terms of pressure and in terms of physical loads and all that there stuff that I'm sure Thomas has to work around. So fascinating insight. I loved it at the end where he was talking about you know dealing with criticism criticism is good because it brings out different parts of feedback and i really want to read about his book because the more i study and look at him the more i think that there's it's just the 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 throw-in aspect of it is just scratching the surface there's someone there who is so forward thinking so brave to to try new things and i think the coaching community we've said it on a lot of podcasts the coaching community can benefit from you know different thinking and, and progressive thinking and challenging traditional methods of doing things because when we get stuck in our ways and our players come in every day and, and are exposed to the same methods and same ideas that we produce week in week out it does take a little bit away from our our ability to influence them and our ability to get that buy-in and get them thinking a little bit more it definitely reduces that so he's going the other way Liverpool are going the other way Midland are going the other way Ajax are going the other way and I think that's a really really interesting path to look at and to, to take into our culture especially over here in the US so we'd love to get your thoughts on it at Gary Kareen on Instagram at Gary Kareen on Twitter appreciate you listening to the podcast again please stay safe with your families and have a great week goodbye Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, head on over to Coach Kernine on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.